Jennifer from Heisel and I'm very pleased today to be joined by Johnny from Greenmint. He is also the Vice Chairman of the Chamber of Commerce. Welcome Johnny. Well, thank you very much Jennifer, very happy to be here. Thank you for joining us. So, uh, let's start by giving a brief introduction about what you do. Um, I landed here in 2003 after a motorbike accident and wanting to do something new. Then I started working with environmental consultancies, with uh, big corporations to develop business within the environmental and sustainability sector. Now I'm working with a company called Greenmont. And um, the thing that might be of interest for your audience is that we've got a solution which uses big data, environmental big data, urban planning big data, industrial transformation big data, which allows companies to get an insight ahead of time where they might be impacted because of industrial upgrades, because of urban um, relocations, or because of, for example, poor air quality, poor water quality, and the local government taking actions, or simply because of um, complaints and things like that. So what kind of companies can use this big data? Is it manufacturing companies specifically? Or companies, no matter what their field is in, can use this big data to see in the future how they might be affected? Any kind of company sourcing or producing or even working with companies sourcing or producing in China would want to know how resilient their right. suppliers, their operations, their clients, even their competitors are. Mm -hmm. So how do you go about finding your clients? Um, well, clients find us. So once they know that you have this information, they're quite curious. And the way we actually do that is we put some of the information online in, a, in an app, which is free. Everybody can use it, which is very simple. You will find five parameters, again, like urban parameters, environmental parameters, industrial parameters, um, environmental scrutiny parameters, and environmental qualities parameters. And people can actually see. They can go online and check how is the factory that I'm interested in doing. Once when they see that, they want to know more then they will contact us and we can go in more detail. Because if the company is going to be impacted, do you want to know, can something be done about it? If something can be done about it, what? If not anything can be done about it, how much time you have left? And how basically do you monitor what might happen that might trigger the company to reduce operation capacity or maybe even have to close doors. So this is quite an accessible piece of information then that anybody can jump on and use to gauge how their future business might be and how um, stable their suppliers are in China. Well, the data is freely accessible for anyone. The added value that we bring to the data is that we interpret what that data means for the company's resilience. Right. Yeah because we kind of score the indices and we combine them because sometimes a company which is performing, um, how shall I say it, poorly, can still go on for a while because they're very important in the industry and they're not causing immediate trouble with local populations. Whereas a company which is, for example, compliant with regulations might be in an area where the environmental quality is very poor. They might be in an outdated or overcapacity type of industry and they might be in, in an area where they are reorganizing the landscape, the urban and the industrial landscape. And how do you see companies in China at the moment working to keep their supply chain resilient? Um, the interesting thing is that um, a lot of companies often don't realize themselves in what situation they are because they've been performing, they've been operating and all these things they change so quickly so they also not always know how things are playing. Uh, some do know, uh, they just continue as long as they can. Uh, some um, do not know, and you can actually help them to understand what is the situation. And how do you see companies in the current geopolitical climate um, comparing, let's say, the rest of the world with China? Um, the companies that I work with, they, they realize that they can't have all eggs in one basket. Uh, so they are looking at uh, diversifying in different regions. On the other hand, um, most of the companies operating in China, they are 
already serving the Chinese market. And, and, and the government really is focusing even more on that. So it really depends a little bit uh, where's the market of the company. And have you seen a change in terms of the percentage of companies who are now outsourcing to China um, post-COVID as opposed to, say, 2019? Now, that's an interesting question because any kind of global company, they, they want to be resilient as well mm. after COVID. Everybody is being impacted. Now, they see that things are catching up in China faster than outside of China. So, do you want to then withdraw because of other aspects? It's a tough discussion. It's a tough choice. Um, you want to diversify, but you want to also want to make sure that you take advantage of the growth. Right. Okay, yeah, very interesting. And how do you see f Chinese factories responding to environmentalism? Do you think um, they are focused on being environmentally friendly, or do you think they kind of push that issue to the side? Well, um, in China, if you walk around, you want to enter any kind of building, you need to show a green coat. So people's behavior is really based on, on having the right code and the government pushing that. Did you know that companies in China have an environmental credit score now? Yeah, I've heard that actually. Yeah, so companies are basically monitored, they're inspected, and the last few years this has increased. I'm not sure if you know this, but since 2007, the government, uh, for the first time, they realized environment is important. That was for the social stability because they saw poor environmental quality would make people unhappy. So they started systematically collecting all data, water, air, over the country. 2012, they saw that the uh, companies were actually polluting the environment and they started systematically collecting the impact of the companies and the industries. So that data since 2007, 12, and then 17 has been collected. Now that data, is allowing the country to uh, kind of very systematically uh, everywhere look at which kind of industry is polluting how much, how much they need, where do they want to uh, develop the industry, which new parks. And in the beginning it was inspections because there were so many things from the past that needed to be corrected. Answering your question, at that time companies weren't very interested mm. in environment. But the inspections now actually are changing into incentives because China has a new green manufacturing system which came alive since 2018 mm -hmm. and it has very specific parameters which allow you to increase your environmental credit score. Now by the end of 2020 this environmental credit score is going to be linked to the social credit score. So a lot of the measurement of the companies are done automatic. If you are performing well if you show that you know what's relevant for the government on performing on water, air emissions, on industrial level of performance, how much resources you use, how much energy, how much waste you produce, you get a good score. If you get a good score, less inspections, um, more incentives, uh, fiscal, um, financial, uh, being an example company, and this actually brings you the benefits. So, that's why companies shifted from not being interested and in now being driven by it. And this is very interesting to realize because this is combined with um, green financing and green bonds um, maturing in China, which is going to unlock money for companies to make these upgrades. Now, what we saw post-COVID is that now suddenly that is going faster. So you can actually see that the government is moving to, uh, again, invest in, in the industry, but in a very focused way, in the things they want. And uh, environment, sustainability, energy is one aspect of it. Big data, artificial intelligence, automation is another part of that. Yeah, that's very interesting. So essentially, um, manufacturers and companies in China, um, they benefit on two sides from being more environmentally friendly. On the one hand, like you said, they can get access to more finance if they show that they are hitting those, those marks from the government. And second of all, with the whole world being so focused on the environmental footprint these days, um, more people 
outside will want to use that supplier compared to a different supplier whose level is potentially lower in the environmentally friendly scale. So I think it's really beneficial. Um, great. And so you would recommend this platform for any kind of um, company who is thinking of outsourcing to China to kind of gauge where they could find good suppliers versus not so good suppliers. They can do that. But can I say something more about the previous aspect? Of course. Europe has a green deal. By 2050, focuses on green, digital and competitive. Mm -hmm. China has the eco-civilization. Focus by 2050 is on green, digital and competitive. So um, post-COVID, there was a one and a half hour presentation by the state council about how they want to reorganize the industry as a whole in China by digitization. So this platform is one way of kind of uh, risk profiling and also understanding where are the incentives for different companies digitally. So companies can actually uh, digitize the way they do supply chain management, the way they do sourcing. But it's very important to realize what is happening. So they are developing a digital business ecosystem that connects the state-owned enterprises with the private companies, with service providers, and even with, for example, farmers. All are part of 2025 plans. Now imagine this, a lot of the data, as I already told you, is being collected. Now this data, unlike the past, when it was kept secret, now is being made public. The population is being actually uh, engaged for uh, finding the poor performance and environment. But at the same way, the government is also making the data available because they know big data feeds artificial intelligence. Mm. So they are really in a very systematic way reorganizing to make data available to this ecosystem, facilitate cooperation and um, build a service providing system where artificial intelligence is going to use that big data to upscale, to drive the performance in this value chain. So now answering your question, if you want to do anything in China, if you're not tapping into the data, into the digitization which is happening here, you basically are um, working in China in the, uh, how shall I say it, in an old fashioned way. Mm. You're, missing, you're missing the things which are important the things that are changing. In two, three years, this is going to be an enormous change. So it actually really changes the way that people source suppliers, is, doesn't it? By putting everything digital, it's not just a case of doing your own individual research. It's a case of using that big data and seeing the overall picture and making your decisions in a more objective fashion. So I think that's really, really useful. And is there anything else you'd like to tell us about what you do? Um, I'll give an example. So. When I work with Greenmint, it's all about environmental information, but it goes beyond environmental information. One of the companies, for example, that I worked with, they were supplying, they were always, they were sourcing from China, they were always bidding, and suddenly they saw that their competitors could go below their cost. And they had no idea how this is even possible. So they started working with companies that have access to the data. Now you must know, those data not always are accessible for the public, but they are the data, the interpretation of the data in reports can be made accessible. Mm -hmm. And from that information, they saw that there were new suppliers producing at 30% lower than the ones they were working with. From the data, they could also find out who those suppliers were. So they shifted their, their supply chain and their production cost went down. Excellent. Yeah, that seems really, really useful. Um, and so in terms of environmental protection and going forward, um, is there any recommendations you would give to, to an audience of potential buyers in terms of if they were thinking of outsourcing to China? Um, if you look at the parameters from the green manufacturing system, um, you must be aware that any kind of supplier that, for example, is um, using more water, more energy than the industrial best practice might still be there today, but might not be there tomorrow. If it's in an industry where there is already overcapacity, it's going to go quickly. If it's an industry which is high value chain or where it's not overcapacity, it might take a bit longer. But it is wise to monitor what is the level of performance 
the best practice within the industry to understand to what extent that specific factory will manage. On the other hand, you can turn this around. Some of the companies I work with not only screen their whole supply chain to see how resilient they are, but they also realize that by upgrading the value chain, they are part of that level of industry where the government is very interested in, and they actually get um, deals which were not possible in the past. For example, wholly foreign owned, mm. where in the past they had to share. In the same way, um, they also are realizing that by being a front leader in this, they can work with their supply chain in a different way, share the value. So they can help them understand where is their risk. It's not just give them criteria to do better, because we all know, right, international companies, they basically set standards and then they have to follow these standards, but they don't like that. I remember uh, visiting companies, for example, Foxconn, who works for uh, another famous company, they didn't like that we did audits there. Uh, just a couple of years ago, a little bit later, they liked it because they realized they could use the report for somebody else. Then uh, a little bit later, they said, this is interesting because actually this is really valuable for me. Can you come and do this? Now, basically, they, they approach us and say, can we buy you? We can't be bought by an industrial player because we basically want to remain independent, being able to work for any kind of company. But this kind of shows how fast it is changing. All right. I think that's super interesting. And I think what yourself and your company offers is very valuable to anyone who is considering that. Very simple. There's many things happening today that are quite tough, right? There's COVID but everything can always be an opportunity. So right. what I recently do is I work a lot with different companies to help them figure out what kind of challenge they're facing and how they can turn it into a benefit. For example, one company is a Hong Kong business leader, an American company, business to business industrial packaging. We look together at um, COVID. This was at the end of uh, January, we saw it coming. And he was worried about that. But we used a different way of thinking and we changed the approach to the market. It was, the headquarters was not so happy because we took a lead here on changing the way we worked. But the result is they increased their business 20% over their planned revenue. They got extra market share because they simply on ground saw which were the problems that were going to happen and they reached out to clients before it happened. So they were there when it happened. At the same time, they started talking with their suppliers. Once they were hit, they knew it was going to last for a while and they made new agreements with the suppliers at lower cost. So suddenly they had clients for which they had a solution, they had lower cost, and they turned this into extra clients, extra revenue, and now they're basically building onto that. So the way they now work with their headquarters is, is being re reconfigured. And that's the advice I would like to give to any company operating in China. If you want to operate in China, you have to really think in terms of not only how to protect your business, not to get copied, but also how to really, really with your local team, work in a local way so you can compete with Chinese companies in the same way the best Chinese companies can do that. Mm. So the best practice of Chinese companies at the same time, if it's a Chinese company you work with, it's all about understanding some of the Western management practices, which can be a solution for the, how shall I say it, the, the Laoban culture in China, where sometimes the Laoban always has a team to execute what they want, no matter how right it is. So a Chinese company is only as good as the boss is. Um, you work in a very specific industry and it would be interesting to know how did you get into that? What was your motivations to go into this kind of um, business and field? Oh, if you go back very far, I studied genetic engineering, um, environmental technologies. I always wanted to kind of uh, help uh, do something good for the people and the planet. As I mentioned, after 10 years, I got my motorbike accident, I came to China as an adventure and I really realized there's so much I could do here. One of the first projects that I had was for a, a French um, semen company and they sent me to Guizhou, which is kind of a bit in the, in, in the west of China, 
to judge whether or not they would buy that factory, to see whether or not they would have environmental issues, liabilities. And I never forget when I arrived there because I saw a little old lady um, on the site. She had just a few teeth in her mouth, but she gave me a very big smile. But she was shoveling hazardous waste barefoot. And I just couldn't think about, she reminded me about my old mom, you know, like, oh my God, this is hazardous. Mm. And you could see her skin was like very rough. Um, so I saw many things which were interesting, which could be improved. But that evening I was writing a report that meant something to me because it was going to be part of the decision of whether or not that company would be bought, whether or not that company would be improved. So I told them which were the issues, how they could be managed. The company ended up being bought. I ended up going back two years later um, to do an audit. And I will never forget because I saw the same old lady. Um, her smile was even bigger and she had probably even less teeth. Hmm. But she was, she was wearing shoes. She was not shoveling hazardous waste. She was doing more light work. Um, I was same, looking at the same company and so much had changed. So I, I, I felt every evening I went to bed, I was doing something meaningful. I was doing that in Europe as well, but the, the, the distance I was helping to bridge here was so much bigger. Right, that's very interesting. And how would you describe then the change? You've been in China a long time and China is well known for a very fast pace of change. You know, one minute the street has almost no buildings and then two months later it's full of high-rise buildings. So how, from your perspective and in your industry, how have you seen the change from when you first arrived to China until now? Yeah, so remember, that was 2004, 2005. Now we talk about 2010. I was working with Siege Tum Hill. It's a Fortune 500 company. They asked me to build a soil and groundwater remediation business in China. And um, that was interesting because not many people were really doing that. And they were building factories, pharmaceutical factories, chemical factories. So the capabilities of the people were there. And I started asking them questions. Um, so you are now using this process to take this chemical out of that liquid to purify it. Can we use that process to take this kind of chemical out of the soil matrix? A similar process. And I never forget the way he looked at me. This was PhD person, very smart, and he looked at me. But, but Johnny, why do you want to do that? I mean, people in China do not eat soil. <laughs> and it was cute in one way, but it also was kind of like indicative in another way. But two years later, we were doing chemical oxidation, a pilot project for the first time in China, and these people were actually implementing it. So that's 2010. Now go forward 10 years. We speak 2020 now. A lot of the people that I mentored at that time, they are sitting in some kind of ministry. They are Asia Pacific sustainability leader in a large Chinese company like a, like a PetroChina or like, like, a, like a Unilever, very big companies. And they are doing everything in the same way as they would do internationally. But the people that I started working with since 2015, they're like, with a gummer, with a jammer, they're like, like very close friends. We can argue in ways because we know we, will, we wake up in, in the same bed the next morning. It's that kind of relationship. And it's a trust relationship. They now are actually helping me understand how fast China's government is moving on a number of things, which is amazing. I'm actually very grateful for what they're teaching me now. What I see happening now is China is absolutely leapfrogging the Western world on environmental governance. The way they use big data, the way they use digitized monitoring, the ways they incentivize this, they, they are doing real-time policy implementation. And many people say, yeah, but in, in China still this issue happens in the environment or still that happens. Well, Rome wasn't built in one day. China will not be built in one day, but it's going to be much faster than, than Rome. And the, the thing is, China is incredibly pragmatical, as I said, right, where there is employment, that is important, but where there is people 
getting sick from environment, that is now more important. That changed in 2017. The constitution of the government from the country changed in 2018. So it's a balancing act where there's overcapacity, will be downsized, but nothing will be done too dramatic that it collapses, but it happens so fast that it does impact. And Chinese people, they, they, they know that when the government changes direction, they need to follow that direction. That's when they benefit. If they don't do, they get into trouble. I'm not sure if you know this, but um, uh, Changfeng, Changfeng Polang, Changfeng Polang, it's basically um, a expression that Chinese people use when there's hardship. It's like a wave that comes. If the storm is very high, the waves will be very high. But if you are able to sail on the waves, they are so high you can touch the sky. So it is this kind of an expression that the government here uses to engage the people in making big changes. And that's something which truly amazes me here, but also helps me understand why such fast transformations are possible, because everybody resonates and everybody here kind of understands what is their collective individual, what's their individual role in this collective. They know they have to. It's kind of being overthrown by the wave or it's surfing on the wave. Right. And could you also tell us a little bit about the factories that you've worked with in China? Have you seen much change factory-wise? And how have you seen um, improvements made um, in the factories within China? Um, I see factories now here, which are uh, state-of-the-art, um, robotized, Industrial 4.0, which I know are the most developed factories for that specific company globally. And I'm talking about international companies. So you see, you see the, the top as well as still some older things. So, um, and the interesting part is, if you talk about the Chinese company, I remember three years ago talking at the textile industry event and some Chinese company leaders were telling me that they saw their industry was in big trouble under pressure because it was outdated there was overcapacity, and, and the government wanted to reduce that. And actually, they wanted to reduce or to export some of that capacity to Southeast Asia. I remember this leader telling me, I don't like to do this. They, they had closed some of the old factories and they were upgrading. But he was also asked to go to uh, Vietnam and to open a factory there. He didn't like that, but he told me, and we can't build an old factory there. We have to build a new factory there. The same way as we have the ones here now, which are automated. So um, again, there is so much difference uh, from factory to factory, but it's going up and it's going up very fast. Um, but there is also the mindset that needs to catch up. Now let's turn back for about three, four years. I was talking with the Chinese leader of a company, state of the art. I was working with DuPont then. At that time, I was a solution architect, looking at what kind of technologies, what kind of solutions, experience does DuPont have from their own industrial activity to help other companies improve. I was working on the factory, this person's new factory, and he was asking me about the technology to treat certain type of waste. And I knew he was actually closing another factory which was polluted and he had problems with the people living surrounding that factory. And I was asking, so how are you going to solve this? Oh, let's not talk about the past. Let's talk about the present. Now, we were helping him there as well. That was fine. But he was so proud about his new factory. And he was really saying, I want to have the best technology to treat this waste. So just tell, tell what it is, and I want to invest in that. And I told him, I don't see your future here. Because we walked over your factory. I'm very sad to tell you, I see your past here. And he was devastated because he was really proud about this. I said, look, I see that you have the best equipment that you can imagine, but the way you're operating that equipment is with the understanding of the past. You're, you're not really using it in the way you should be using. For example, um, management of change. You're making fast upgrades and you have a, a factory which is perfectly installed for treating the wastewater in a wastewater treatment system, but you install a new part, the people that are installing this, probably local contractor, 
managed by a local ETS manager, they're not aware about why some things are happening. And I see that you basically are directly discharging into a, a stormwater pipe. I see leakages there, which are corrosive. I see many practices which is going to make this new factory look like the old factory in, in another two, three years. He looked at me like, what do I need to do? Mm. He said, you need to not only transform your equipment, you need to transform your capabilities, your organization and your mindset. Because in the Chinese company, if, if the Laban, if the boss says, this is what we do, the team will execute. So at that time, I was helping companies with cultural transformation. I was so fascinated. So, I mean, I learned things from the university in Sydney about intrinsic motivation, psychology to install a safety culture. When I was in China, I realized that intrinsic motivation for a Chinese person is per definition different from a Western person because a Chinese person thinks from within a collective. His intrinsic motivation comes from what is his role in the collective. So I kind of had to change that and I couldn't even translate that. So I had to kind of rediscover what it was, the Chinese people telling me how to say this in Chinese and then implement it in that way, in an understandable way. But I was able to bring that back to the headquarters and said, you see, this is how basically you can change uh, organizations, societies where you have um, layers and where you have um, different aspects working together, not just changing individuals. And actually it works very beautifully. It's really, really interesting. Yeah, it sounds very, very interesting. And we really, really appreciate all your insights today. I think you touched on some really interesting points there, especially the one about agility. You know, agility is really key, especially after the year we've had, for companies to, yeah, number one, plan about for any eventuality in the future, how will they respond? And also to be able to respond quickly when something like that does happen. So to change the strategy to be able to continue and get some more resilience in their supply chain. So thank you very, very much for coming today. It's been a pleasure to have you and we hope to see you again soon, Johnny. My pleasure. Thank Jennifer. you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you everyone for listening in today. I'm sure you found it very, very useful and we'll give Johnny's details um, at the end of the, the video for you to contact him. Goodbye. Bye bye. Thank you.